All right, so we are live. Welcome to the Gunner Technology live stream, a weekly tech talk for non-techies and techies alike. I'm your host, Gary Merkins. With me is Cody Swan, CEO of Gunner Technology, and a special guest joining us again is uh, J.C. Bolahan, Ph.D. from Indiana. Is that right? Yep, IU Bloomington, School of Informa Informatics and Computing. Oh, awesome. Uh, are you currently part of the program or finished up? Yeah, I'm a Ph.D. there. Uh, I research social media, big data, um, and online identity. Awesome. Yes, have you decided what your uh, thesis is going to be on? Um, so it's, it's going to be on identity online. Oh, well, it's perfect for this topic, right? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so speaking of, let's go ahead and dive right into uh, today's episode. First things first, we have our Country Store giveaway. Country Store is a lifestyle brand for anyone who loves the outdoors. You can visit them at countrystoreoutfitters.com. And uh, you can enter the Country Store giveaway on our Facebook page. The winner this week is Michael T. from Houston, Texas. Uh, I assume Michael's dealt with hurricanes too, Cody. Didn't Houston get like a huge hurricane last summer? A two? Oh, uh, it was. It, it was that a number of summers ago. Yeah, that was. Um, <laughs> I lose track of years. That was. Uh, yeah, that was the one that just dumped all that rain. It just stalled out and just dumped rain like crazy. Yeah. Harvey, right? That's mm -hmm. it. Harvey? That's it. That's right. Yep. So, someone's got a better memory than both of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, Michael, you've got a Country Store hat heading your way along with copies of our eBooks. Uh, I was going to say anyone who didn't win this week can enter next week's episode, but we're actually heading on our fall break after this episode. So, uh, no Country Store giveaway for a little while yet, but uh, definitely check them out at CountryStoreOptimers.com. While you're on our Facebook page, go ahead and answer our question of the week, which this past week, and I take full blame for this one. The, the question of the week this past week was, should companies pay you for the use of your data? And I realize now... Uh, phrasing a question, should X pay you for something that they're not currently paying you for, the response is going to be basically 100% yes, uh, which it was. Um, but, I, I mean, we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit today, uh, especially in terms of how valuable user data is. But uh, at least our Facebook fans definitely want to be paid for companies using their data. And maybe that's a, a good place to jump in. Um, is the actual ownership of data. So today's topic is big data. And so, uh, like, uh, obviously, that's a buzzword nowadays. Data is of the utmost importance for basically every company who's successful now. Um, so one of the big questions with data, especially online, is who actually owns the data. And one of the things I, I read this past week, and it's maybe a hyperbolic analogy, but maybe not, uh, is the idea that as data collection has gotten more robust and more sophisticated and the profiles that are being built on users are becoming more intricate and detailed, you almost have something like a digital identity online. You almost have mm -hmm. uh, a, a pseudo personhood, if you will, of uh, a digital representation. And so uh, one of the uh, articles I read claimed that the ownership of data is somewhat akin to a form of like digital slavery where you own where, where you own a person's data to the point where you own that that person's digital identity do you, do you think that's a legitimate argument jt or do you think that's a little bit over the top you know i, I think that specific argument might be a little hyperbolic um what i might compare it to is the advent of sports video games where you saw a situation where there were digital representations of athletes mm -hmm. and the athletes were the primary good that people wanted to consume, right? You want to play um, the latest soccer game because the latest soccer stars are in it. Right. Um, but the, the athletes themselves aren't actually in the game. It's just a digital representation of them, right? And it's the same idea with social networks where, or, you know, an Apple or a Google, right, where you, you have all this data about the people. Um, and that's why the, these platforms are so valuable is because there's the data. Um, and, you know, the, the people aren't profiting. Um, and so there, there probably does need to be some way to, to monetize some uses of those data, of that data, what uses need uh, to be com compensated? Yeah. That's, that's another question. I mean, yeah, Cody, it's, uh, 
Do you remember the big uproar around um, college football players with the uh, college football video games? Because that was even worse, where they weren't even getting paid, period, and their likenesses were being used in the video game. Uh, so it, that seems to be sort of like the direct analogy here, where users aren't necessarily being directly compensated, but their data mm -hmm. is being used to fuel these multi-billion dollar companies. Yeah, I mean, I always just wonder if this is if this is kind of like a like I, I always wonder when we talk about this. Like, who, I, obviously, there's a there's a vocal majority of people who are up in arms about big companies owning our data. But like, if we were to take a poll of the majority of Americans, would 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 I would wager that most people in, in like an unbiased question, I would say most people are very comfortable with what or, or don't care that these these companies have their data and or, maybe it's from, maybe it's from a standpoint of ignorance yeah i was gonna um, say potentially are unaware of how their data is being used which is again we'll, we'll get to that topic of consent and sort of openness about how data i think used. one of the other one of the other things we need to bring in to this is that a lot of the times these services are free right so mm -hmm. the reason you get to use these services um which costs money to run right it costs yeah. uh it costs Facebook, for example, money to store your photos. It costs them money to store your conversations. Um, it's cost them money to connect you with all of your your friends and associates and family members. Um, you don't have to pay any of those storage costs. You don't have to back any of your, your stuff up. Um, you don't have to worry about making it available to the masses or you know organizing web servers or any of that nonsense, right? All you have to do is send messages and you can you can consume it for free um, the trade-off is that you you do pay with your data right so there's a value there and in some senses um, that value is your data and, and I guess there the the issue comes in terms of the hidden costs right in terms of mm -hmm. how your data is actually used and uh, I, I didn't realize that like Amazon obviously Google is an ad company uh, I'm not. Sh I, I think most people realize that now, because 90% or more of their revenue comes from uh, their ad products. Facebook is uh, almost as large as Google. I think they're 40% of the market, and Google's like 38%, and Google is 40 something percent. And a Amazon is actually rapidly catching up. I read mm. something that their. Uh, I think their ad services generated twice as much revenue as their retail services last year. Uh, so they're focusing on the ad space. So, um, I mean, I guess, is it is it that users are fine with their data being used to target ads of people, or is it that people are unaware of how broadly their data is being used? Cody, what do you think? Do you think people are probably fine with that in exchange for, uh, yeah, for the mean, free services? Th th that's the thing is, like, I mean, the minute you say to someone, okay, great, like, your, your data is a currency, right? It is a currency. It, it's, it's why we're able to offer you this for free or cheap. It, like, if, if you don't want us to use our, your, your data, great, and it's going to be this much. Like, yeah. People are, are going to bail right away. Like, it's, a, it's, it's, it's almost, like, presumptuous. And it goes back to, like, the, the, the large majority of kind of the educated elite don't understand what it's like to run a company. They, 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 they don't. Like, they almost like get upset that a company makes a profit kind of thing. And like, they don't understand, they don't understand that, that like that the cup, these companies have to keep the lights on some way. I, I get it. Some are greedy, <laughs> not buybacks. I, I, I get yeah. it. But like, like it's crazy. This isn't like, this isn't charity, right? Like they have to make money somehow, some way. And it's either they charge you a direct cost or an indirect cost. And I think, Mm -hmm. By far, most people would be are more comfortable with the indirect cost. But do you yeah, think? Yeah, I think that's go, exactly go ahead, right. Jackie. And if you look at the if you look at the success of things like um, like you can subscribe to pay for email services that are you know very high quality, but you have to pay because they don't monetize your email data and turn it in, and use it to you know, serve you ads and, and construct you know, a profile of you, right? Um, like Google and Yahoo and who, whichever email Microsoft um, all do. Um, but you have to pay for that service and pretty much nobody uses those services. Right, right. right? So the, the market exists and the market is out there and if people wanted to opt into a 
service where they had to pay for privacy or pay for the services without exchange, instead of exchanging it for their data, they could do that. Uh, largely, we don't see people doing that. Yeah, I guess you find out quickly how much people are willing to pay to keep their data private, uh, which rapidly approaches zero uh, when all these free <laughs> services exist. Um, do, do you think, like, I, I know you companies aren't charities, but do you think there should be some sort of, like, good faith effort to compensate users in terms of, like, maybe a market for, the, there's an idea out there for um, personal data trading is, is folks are trying to sort of, like, start up the idea of people actually being able to explicitly sell their data as opposed to implicitly sell their data by uh, using these services. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's any any value there in terms of, uh, I, I'll, I'll say, urging companies to maybe go to a model where users are able to more actively control their data and more actively, uh, I guess, monetize their data by selling it to companies? I think it's an interesting idea. I think it would be, it's an exciting market proposition. You know, we, you do business on our site um, and we can pay you for your activity or, you know, you, you sign over the rights to your, you get, you get all your data from Google, you get all your data from Facebook, you provide it to us and we'll give you some money mm -hmm. in exchange. I think the former, you know, is, is harder Right? If you wanted to compete directly with a Facebook or a Twitter and pay people, um, you, know, you, you have the problem of not having the network effect, right? So you have to get through those first four, five, six years building yeah. your network um, all the while you're losing massive amounts of money because you're having to pay everyone. Yeah, I mean, um, I, realistically, the only companies think, that could try this are sort of the, the big five, Google, Facebook, right. Amazon, Apple. And you could see uh, you could see Microsoft trying to do it in order to kill a Facebook, right? Yeah. Or you could see you know you could see Facebook trying to do it to compete with um, somebody else. If, or if they ever started to lose market share, they could start to give people money to mm -hmm. use their platform. Um, I don't I don't see a competitor being able to come into the market to really do that, just because you know I, I don't think I think the the amount of money that it would be would be so small that nobody would would blink. Yeah. Well, one interesting thing, thing I came across, I want to just shout this out. Uh, there's there's a plugin called Track Me Not uh, that I'd never heard of before. I think it's from NYU maybe. Uh, but it's basically a plugin that you use to, uh, it basically spams like phony searches from your browser so that it makes it more difficult for search engines to build a profile on you. So it just puts a bunch of bogus searches in every now and then. Uh, so that companies have no idea who you are or what you like or uh, what your personality is. I thought that was a really interesting idea. It's not necessarily, it's not hiding data, it's just obfuscating data. It's like, I, I guess like a spy technique where you just put out a bunch of fake messages and then sneak in a real one every now and then. So it makes it that much harder to, uh, <laughs> to track you. Um, I, one, one other thing I came across in terms of ownership of data is, and this goes to GDPR and, and what Europe's doing, is the idea of control of your data and being able to, I guess, both see how your data is being used, but also to be able to move your data to different platforms. So uh, right now you're basically, if you use Facebook or Instagram, you're somewhat locked in. Uh, to, uh, I, I don't use Facebook or Instagram all that much, but I would imagine it would take my brother and sister uh, probably the better part of a month to like migrate all their images, all their descriptions to a different platform. So should companies... I guess be forced to uh, provide a way. Uh, Cody, you're not going to like this because companies shouldn't be forced to do anything, right? But but do you think, Cody, that companies should allow you to migrate to a different platform if you want to? I I mean no. I, I, I think that's a <laughs> that's a value added, right? Like yeah. I mean like that, that that it's competition, right? Like it, it, that's a value you can add to your services. That's a value you can add over your competitors. Like hey, come use us because we allow data portability, like our competitors don't. Mm -hmm. if, if, if companies aren't offering that, that's because it's not valued by a large amount of their customer base. I, again, there are, there, there's a huge sect of the technology world, you know, I call us all geeks. There's a huge section of geeks where this is extremely important and geeks have, ty have a type of way of kind of like getting in their echo chamber and thinking that because something is so important to them, it should be 
so important to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is data portability is not that big of a deal outside of like the geek community. Again, maybe it's because we understand it, uh, you know, then, then, then if we understand it and the rest of the populace doesn't, our job is to educate them. And if education fails, then maybe it's just, we have a different value system than the majority of Americans, but companies, they, they can't afford to ignore the majority, right? Like mm -hmm. they can absolutely ignore a vocal minority and say, we hear you and make, make uh, token capitulations, but not really any changes. But if the actual majority of their customers demand something, they'll, they'll, they'll give it right. Because it's a, it's a, it's about, uh, you know, pluses and minuses. Yeah. So if, 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 uh, if that's value, then a company would say, Hey, come use us. We offer this and our competitors don't. Do you, do you agree with that, JT? Do you think maybe the uh, legislative approach to mandating that companies provide more robust control over their data to users is, is some sort of uh, governmental overstep? Or do you think that's the only realistic way when there are these big companies? I mean, it's ironic that the Internet is supposed to be like a, a, a not owned by anyone in, in theory, and yet uh, mm. five major companies sort of control the vast majority of the traffic on the internet or, or at least control where the traffic goes. Um, so do, do you think there is a role for uh, programs like GDPR and, and other legislative approaches or do you think it really should come from the companies themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I think GDPR is a probably as somebody who works in technology, it's something that scares me because I think it was a very poorly thought out piece of legislation that's going to have, you know, it's going to have real ramifications on who can do business. Mm -hmm. um, it's, so it was positioned as something that would work to combat big corporations on behalf of individuals. Right. And it does that to some extent. Um, but, you know, I've talked to a lot of people who, work for small tech adjacent companies yeah. and they won't run, they won't, they can't do business in Europe anymore uh, because they can't comply with GDPR. Um, GDPR compliance is, is really complicated. The right to be forgotten, yeah. uh, especially in an age of machine learning is, is problematic because you, you can't, um, to be able to fully unravel the per, an individual's impact on your on your data system when you have such a such a sophisticated architecture, um, especially you know in the direction that things are going now, where big tech is just getting more and more complicated. Yeah. Um, I think it's it's you know only a, only a, only a lawyer could think that that's the type of thing that <laughs> could be achievable. Do, do, do um, you have, do you even know like? If someone requests that their data be pulled from, say, a company who builds uh, machine learning algorithms based off of user data, like would they have yeah. to pull the the row of data out of their database yeah, so and rerun the the machine learning uh, program? What they're like? supposed to do is they're supposed yeah that's what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to Jeez. if a person wants to be forgotten, uh, Google would have to remove their if you know if we're talking about Google, right? Yeah. Um, they might have to remove all that user search records um, and all their clicks and, and then rerun it. Um, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily that. Um, that individual thing is not that uh, sophisticated, but the fact that you then have to find all the places that that algorithm was used or previous versions of that algorithm that include that user's data were used and then re institute those, mm. that's the challenge. You have so many interconnected pieces, and you have to roll all of them back. Yeah, that's um, tough. I mean, and, I guess that's, that's another example of unintended consequences. And it, a lot of, a lot of, uh, well, it's, go ahead. It's, um, it's the European government saying that we want um, you to do, they're imposing a cost on the market that's so large um, and there's going to be a big company that rises up and meets this challenge and produces a service that can 
that can do this for people. Um, but all it's going to do is it's going to ch channel money to that company, whoever gets there first, right? Is it yeah. if it's Microsoft or if it's uh, Apple or you know uh, a Google or someone like that, right? Who they all have vested interest in solving this problem for themselves. Mm -hmm. But there's also this huge market of companies that need the solution. Amazon is another one that uh, is probably trying to solve this problem as well. Um, and so they're you know they've they've created a market out of nowhere, uh, and it's you know, there are a lot of, it's very, very concerning from that respect. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and pivot to uh, a different topic here and talk about the idea of consent uh, as it pertains to big data. Uh, th there's a lot of, um, I mean, there's, there's some big news items around this. Uh, obviously, the Facebook uh, poll that created, or I guess it wasn't a poll, it was a, it was a, Facebook application that gave you like a big five personality test that was then used by Cambridge Analytica to build uh, uh, I, polling profiles and, and targeted um, political campaigns uh, that obviously had huge ramifications for the UK and uh, the US governments. Um, and I guess per the Netflix documentary, governments around the world. Um, the, the, my favorite one though is, um, I forget which company it was, but there's a DNA testing company that I guess I, unbeknownst, I guess it was in the terms of service, but uh, was sharing its data with law enforcement and someone's cousin. Uh, uh, there was a California serial killer, and his cousin took a DNA test, and then that DNA was used to basically uh, pin all of these murders on him, like 20 or 30 years after the fact, which is awesome. Obviously, we're all big fans of that. Uh, but what is... What is the responsibility of companies in terms of uh, being explicit about how users' data is going to be used and making sure that users are informed of all the different ways that their data is going to be utilized uh, as they're using these services, JT? Like, obviously, it's going to be in some small fonted text in some massive uh, uh, agreement between the user mm -hmm. and the company, but do you think that's enough, or do we need something beyond that uh, so that users know how their data is actually being used? Yeah, I think this is a. I think this is one of the areas where it's it's really expecting too much of people to be able to comprehend the uses of their data. Um, especially in the case of 23andMe, where you're explicitly saying, I'm giving you this for this service, right? And then they turn around and, and use the, the thing you gave them for something else, right? They, expect, yeah. they, they expected that they were going to be in one transaction, which they did pay money for, right? They paid hundreds of dollars for the service. Uh, I think it's $199 or whatever the service costs, mm -hmm. right? But it's a, it's a, there's money trans changing hands. So in their mind, I get, hand you the money, you give me, and some DNA, and you give me the results, right? So that's the end of the transaction. Um, to me, it seems that it's deceptive to do anything beyond that, right? The same way um, it might be deceptive for a uh, health tracking, right, if you have a, for Apple to turn around and sell your Apple Watch heart rate data, um, to your health insurance company. Right, right. Um, that, that, that probably isn't the, you know, right use. You don't expect that use. Um, it seems beyond the, beyond the pale, right? Where we're, where we're online, we expect that, you know, people are showing us ads. Uh, that's kind of how the Internet functions. It, that's, an, that's something we accept. Um, you know, running a side business on my data, that's, that seems to me, anyway, to be uh, an abuse of people's ignorance. What do, you, what do you think, Cody? Do you think it's uh, do you think it's caveat emptor, buyer beware? Uh, uh, well, I mean, here it, 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 it's 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 weird, right? Because like uh, I totally agree that it just doesn't make sense to try to legislate everything. Like we had this conversation about Boeing, right? Like you can't say it's buyer beware. Uh, that a plane goes down, right? Like, you, you can't just say, like, oh, well, the market will correct itself if there's a horrible plane crash. Or you can you? Like, oh. <laughs> I, I mean, you, you can say that. You can say that. It's, 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 it's callous, to say the least, and incorrect, uh, you know, in, in the scope of an argument. Like, yeah. 
Um, but because the thing is, is like, again, companies, I'm not trying to say companies are altruistic uh, because they, they build into their costs like, uh, you know, lawsuits and, 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 and kind of uh, catastrophes and stuff like that. So there has to be some legislation. There has to be some government oversight of, of things that if they go wrong, they're catastrophic. I just don't put data breaches or not even data breaches. It's because it's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about misuse of data or sketchy use of data, right? Yeah. Um, sketchy use of data in the category of a, 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 a catastrophic failure. Well, um, I, I think uh, a lot of UK voters would disagree with you there uh, in terms of like the Brexit campaign. I, I say, I say, or can you tongue in cheek? Because it, obviously, um, I'm on the other side of the issue. But uh, I guess it's it's it, it is difficult. Uh, companies could surely be more explicit about how users' data is used, though, more upfront. I, I, it, at what point? Does Apple, for example, need to say your Apple Watch data is going to be shared with Aetna, your healthcare provider? Um, should that be an explicit mention before you actually use the in, product? There's also the case where if a company is turning around and handing your data off to someone else as opposed to selling a service on top of your data, that's, that's a situation in which they are depriving you of the right to profit off of your data, right? Mm -hmm. They're profiting off of information about you without your approval, right? It's your DNA that is worth the money. Um, if somebody wants your DNA, they should have to pay you for it. They shouldn't be able to get it from this company that got it because you wanted, you know, a genealogical analysis, right? right. Um, unless, you know, that was explicitly part of the deal, but it's not because, you know, you look on their site and it, it doesn't say we turn around and sell your DNA to companies and drug manufacturers and whatever, right? It says, we'll tell you whether you're, uh, you know, 2% Cherokee or what. Right, right. With, with a little asterisk that says, please see uh, <laughs> the, the full terms for all the ways you use your data, and it's 900 pages of legal text that nobody can parse. Right. I, I mean, yeah. the, the, the problem we have here is one of scale, right? Like, I mean, again, I always go back to equating companies as individuals almost. Like, and if you, Derry, or me, Cody, or, or anyone at an individual level was to go to a friend or even someone at the gym and be like, um, you know, start striking up a conversation and, and be like, yeah, I use uh, medication X for my heart because I have a, you know, heart condition and I beat cancer last year. And then, like, that person goes and tells a whole bunch of other people. Like, is that wrong? Well, I, I don't know. You told them that. You told them the information. You didn't say, and please don't go say anything to anyone else about this. And if that happens, you have a choice, right? You can say, that's no big deal. I'll continue to talk to this person and share stuff with them. Or you can be like, that was messed up. I was telling them something in confidence to further a conversation and kind of, like, uh, increase my value. And he used he or she used that information in a way that I didn't want him to. So I'm not going to give that person any more information, right? Mm -hmm. Like it only becomes a problem at scale where companies can do this, you know, a million times over very quickly. And uh, but, but it's it's still the same concept, right? Like if you don't like what the company is doing with your data, stop giving it to them. Well, I mean, therein lies like you. you that's a great point because you do lose sort of the nuance of human to human interaction when you're giving data to big companies. I mean, if you're having a private conversation with someone, there's an implicit agreement between the two parties that uh, this conversation won't be shared. Uh, and I think maybe the problem comes that uh, people imagine that companies function the same way as individuals that they're talking to, or they're, I guess, maybe anthropomorphize the company and say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just going to assume that if I share this data with you, you're not going to use it for any sort of uh, secondary purposes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, maybe that's just how yeah. people I imagine uh, that their data isn't going to be used, but apparently it is. One of the um, one of the things that I think are have been slow to catch on to is that we're, you know, one of the things that it means to live in an era of big data is that it's cheaper to store data than it is to get rid of data. <laughs> um, right. And so we. Everything that you do 
uh, if you're interacting with a with a modern company, it's it's cost effective for them to store that interaction, right? Um, and I I think that that's that's not something that's set in for the average person. Is that everything you do is law forever? Um, Which is tough. I guess I guess people are slowly learning that that's the case. And and maybe like a a, a topic to uh, to wrap up with here is the idea of the datification of children, especially in terms of consent and understanding. What what responsibilities, JT, do you think companies have? I, I like they must have some sort of above and beyond responsibility because. As uh, abstruse as all of this legal language is, once you introduce, uh, you know, users under the age of, I don't know, say 12, 14, who, who couldn't even understand it if they read it, don't mm -hmm. companies have like a, a, a much higher degree of responsibility for at least informing the parents of how their children's data is going to be used? Yeah, I think the... The question of the datification of children is very similar to questions of advertising to children, right? Uh, there, we've passed laws that say you can't, you know, advertise cigarettes in uh, your magazines or TV shows dedicated to children, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if you're still allowed to advertise cigarettes on TV, but um, <laughs> you know, we would be we would be sad if Joe Camel was smoking with Dora the Explorer. Um, <laughs> Actually, that would be amazing. Might, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we might enjoy it, but uh, <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. the public at large, right, <laughs> yeah, um, we wouldn't appreciate that too much. Um, and and we do protect children more than we protect adults. And so I think you know to some degree that's there. What worries me is people who are unknowingly giving away uh, the data of their children. Um, by posting photos of their children as infants, as two-year-olds, mm -hmm. as you know, five-year-olds, as ten-year-olds on on Facebook, on Instagram, before they're able to make those decisions themselves. Um, if you, I mean, I can imagine a world in which your parent has a active Facebook life where they post photos of you and also has uh, enrolled themselves in one of these 23andMe programs, right, um, and has an Apple Watch, right, if uh, a data breach happens in the wrong way, uh, you could imagine the child having almost a, you could have a full, you know, medical read out of that child yeah. with, um, you know, uh, all the pictures you need to, to deep fake them into eternity. Um, Right, without without necessarily having any of that child's data, um, and or any data that that child provided, right? So yeah. by the time they're they're eighteen uh, and can actually consent to you know whatever, right, or fourteen or whatever we imagine this, this age of consent for for online behavior or data giving away is, um, it might already be out of the bag by that point, and I think yeah. that is, you know, it's, it's the parent's responsibility, but I think it's another consent issue where if the parents don't fully understand what they're doing, which every indication is that they don't, can the parent really consent? I'm not sure. Um, it's weird. You know, it's like every, every kid today is basically their own version of the Truman Show, where their entire lives are basically online from the day they're born. And, and I guess maybe mm -hmm. that, that might, like, rope back to the idea of, the right to be forgotten because if you turn uh, 15 or 18 or whatever age it is and you see all this stuff about you online, you're like, I didn't want any of this yeah. to be online. I didn't. I, mean, I, will, I will say the thing is like, and, and I take, I take full credit for this, for being prophetic on this, but like this changes society, right? Like think about, think about uh, 10 years ago, maybe a little bit more than 10 years ago, how, like scandalous it was when someone had nude photos leak online, right? Think about how scandalous it was. Mm -hmm. Now it's like no big deal, right? <laughs> so what? We're, it's not. It's not a big deal. Like no one cares. Like everyone knows that they take photos of like themselves nude and send it to their significant other. It's not a big deal. 
what we're learning about humanity is we're learning a lot. Is it, it, like mm. we're learning that like people are much more like us. Like Beto O'Rourke got a DUI. No one cares. Like no one cares. He got a DUI. And I think he left the scene. Like yeah, if people. You know, so what people are starting to say is, oh, he's just like me because I had a DUI and I left the scene. And so like all these things that were like so shocking and like oh he did this when he was eighteen years old. Now like society's changing and it's like yeah. So did I. And like, I mean, I never had a DUI, so shame on you, Beto. <laughs> but like, <laughs> um, but my, my point is, is like, we're, it's changing society in the fact that we're becoming a more tolerant society of the ways people used to be and a more forgiving society because we're just learning more about ourselves, I think. For better or for worse, I guess. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that's the positive, the pot of positive spin on the uh, surveillance <laughs> environment. Uh, that's all. Any, any concluding thoughts, JT, on, on the idea of big data? Maybe like where, where big data and control of data is heading in the future? Yeah, I would say to a large degree, the, the key idea I have about big data, or you know, the key thing I would hope people take away about when thinking about big data, um, is that there's a large discrepancy between what most people think is possible and what the companies on the cutting edge are doing. Um, And that's not necessarily a data problem, but I do think it poses a consent problem where people can't fully understand the ramifications of their actions. Mm -hmm. Um, and, And so in some ways, it's like the the British sailor getting signed up for the Navy while he's drunk. <laughs> right, right, right. right. Where it's, it's like you, you don't really understand what you're doing, so can you be held to the, to the ramifications of it? Um, at the same time, it's clear that these services that are run on massive amounts of data do good for the fact that I'm saying. Yeah. Um, well, actually, let me just ask you one quick question. Mm-hmm. Let, let me ask you one quick question on that. Uh, like, what, what do you think would be a viable method to educate the population at large about how their data is being used? I don't know if it's the type of situation where you're going to be able to educate people. I think it would be the type of situation where um, there would have to be someone – I think you have you would have to ch- someone would have to challenge the use of their data um, in court and win yeah. in such a way that it imposed a, such a legal uh, such a financial burden on uh, non explicit uses of data that encourage companies not to do it um, because I, I don't think that legislators are sophisticated enough to understand the problem and legislate it or produce laws to regulate it effectively. Um, and I, I don't know if, and I'm confident that companies are nimble enough that they would find new ways to profit. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, cigarette companies uh, having to go before Congress, like the, the sunlight is the best mm-hmm. disinfectant kind of methodology where maybe the, the best solution is just, and I guess it's sort of starting. You, you've seen it with Zuckerberg having to go before, testify before Congress. I, I guess maybe that's the most viable option is just to uh, sort of shine a light on how uh, data is being used, right? Yeah, I, I, will, say, I will say also that uh, a, a real opportunity or something to watch here is the national security angle. Like, because... Uh, supposedly all of the data, I mean, among the responsible companies, all the data is anonymized, right? But like there was, I was reading stuff about like location data, right? It's anonymized, but you can see, you know, Jane Doe or Anonymous X, uh, their daily routine. So like you can see this anonymized user goes from address 153 uh, Brooklyn Street to... Um, 999 Main Street, and you can see that 999 Main Street is a power plant, and you can surmise that if they're going to that other address every day, that's their home. So, you, like, a, a hostile foreign government can identify that person 
as a nuclear power employee and attempt to compromise that person or again the pentagon or you know any other um, sensitive areas of national security and so that could be the end the government is looking for to really get in there and say ah, 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 we're gonna we're gonna regulate this stuff because this is becoming a national security risk that that, yeah. that i could see as a distinct possibility so it's mm-hmm. it, in kind of a roundabout way the government will uh I guess be the ones to sort of bring this to the to the forefront of people's minds. I, I think Anonymous sure. X is going to be my DJ name, by the way. That's a great DJ. Name. <laughs> um, I, I think that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Gunner Technology Livestream. Before we wrap up here, actually, uh, JT, can you tell us a little bit about your book, uh, Mastering Large Data Sets with Python? Or sure, yeah. So the book, yeah, I can tell you real quick. So the book is a um, introduction to big data for developers, so software developers who don't be primarily in big data, this book is onboarding them into the world of big data, uh, shows them tips and tricks on how to work with big data, them to the modern uh, big data frameworks. And there is a discount code for uh, this awesome book uh, in the description below. We're actually doing a giveaway too for uh, a free copy of uh, JT's book, so keep an eye out for that. Um, but that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Gunner Technology Livestream. Uh, I was going to say tune in next Wednesday for the next episode, but we're actually heading on our fall break. So uh, you'll probably catch us in a couple weeks, uh, maybe a month or two. Uh, we're going to have some big changes when we come back, so keep an eye out for those. But in the meantime, uh, you can go ahead and hop on our Facebook page. Uh, we're not going to have questions. Uh, maybe we'll have questions of the week. I guess we can keep those going. Um, we won't have country giveaways, though, uh, each week, which is sad. Um, but definitely check out Country Outfitters at countryoutfitters.com. Uh, the blog post for this episode will be available at guntertech.com. The podcast will be available on iTunes. Uh, check out our ebooks on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iBooks, Kobo, and anywhere else ebooks are sold. Uh, I think that's going to be it. Uh, I was going to thank JT for uh, hopping on, but I know he had to hop off real quick because he had a hard stop at 11. So thanks for sticking around for a couple extra minutes. Uh, Cody, any final thoughts on this, this season of the text ethics series. We've come a long way. Yeah, it, it's, it's interesting. And, and, and again, what the great unknown to me is, is in a lot of these things is uh, since we're always in the weeds and we've talked to people that are in the weeds, it's like how much, how, again, I, I know I, I don't want to beat a dead horse here, but how much does the actual Joe care about this? And if we sat down and educated the actual Joe, would they care anymore? Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. It, it's interesting. So it, I, I go back and forth where if you're if you're in quicksand, quicksand's a big problem. But if you're not in quicksand, <laughs> quicksand's not, not a real big problem. So I, you know, I, I I always think about that is 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 are we making a big deal out of it because we understand the the worst case scenarios and other people don't, or is it just not a big deal to the people? And per Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, if you're in quicksand, have someone throw you a giant like boa constrictor, I think, <laughs> and then they can pull you out by a snake from quicksand. Remember that? Absolutely. That's a classic oh, yes. moment. Um, so that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Gunner Technology Livestream. Again, that's going to do it for this season. Uh, we're on our fall break now, but uh, keep an eye on our Facebook page. We'll sort of announce when uh, the next live stream season is going to kick off, again, with big changes. Uh, should be some cool stuff coming your way. Uh, but that's going to do it for this week's episode and for the Text Ethics series. I'm Derry, that's Cody, and we'll, uh, we'll see you when we see you.